So I wanted to give you a quick overview of what an HTML5 form is and how you can use it to submit data to the backend. Um, in a general sense, all a form is is a way to encapsulate a bunch of input boxes that have names and take that data, package it up, and send it from your browser to an endpoint. So I'm going to show you that, how to build it out, and then also in the Chrome browser, kind of show you what's going on behind the scenes so you have a better understanding of the actual network request that it's making. So on the left here, I have an index HTML file. And if I scaffold out a bare bones HTML file, you can see that we have a couple of tags here. We have HTML. Inside of that, we have a head and a body. Hopefully none of this is really new to you. But if you are new, just know that HTML is built up of these different tags, which you can further nest more tags inside of them. So the one we're kind of uh, curious about right here is the body. The body is where you store all of your HTML content. And the thing we're trying to build here is a form, right? So in HTML, there is a tag called form. So let's just go ahead and declare a form here. And a form by itself doesn't really do anything. You need to actually have some inputs. So let's just pretend that we're doing like a contact us form or something. And there's an input here. So I can do another tag in HTML, it's called input. And that input takes a couple of what we call attributes, right? So the most important attribute that you need is name. So name is the actual like key that is going to be sent in the request to the back end. So in this case, we could have like a name could be a address, right? And then you could just go ahead and close off that input. And you can see over here on the right side where I have my Chrome browser running, an input form popped up. Now I do want to state in order to get these dev tools open, this is called the dev tools. You can right click on the page and say inspect element or inspect. And that'll pop up the dev tools. This is a super important tool to understand and get used to because this is the one way that you can really dive in and debug and understand what your page is doing. So we're going to be using that hopefully in this video. But notice here, if we expand the actual nodes, this is like your element viewer, and this shows you the actual contents of the page. So if you go here, you can see that we have a form and it has an input, right? So it's kind of matching one to one with what we have over here. Now the importance of the form is typically there is a submit button, right? You need a way to tell the browser, hey, take all the data that the user entered into the form and submit it somewhere. So the second thing we typically do is we make a button and we give it a type of submit. So I could just give the button some text inside of it. By the way, some HTML tags require that you actually put content inside of them. So in this case, the button tag takes actual text. And that text is what's going to be showing up here over here on the right side of this page. You see there's submit showing up. Cool. So now we actually have a form that you can submit. So let's actually kind of play around with this and see what happens when you click on submit button. So I'm going to type in like hello here. And inside of the dev tools, let's click on these arrows here and click on network. I want to show you what's happening behind the scenes. Make sure you have preserve log on because it's actually going to do something strange. It's actually going to refresh the page when I submit this. So let's just go ahead and click submit. And you'll notice that the page actually cleared out the input box, right? There's nothing in this input box anymore because what's actually happening is that the page is doing a request to a backend. And then when it gets a response back, it's refreshing the page, which basically clears out everything that you typed in, right? And let's further kind of inspect what's going on. So if I open up this a little bit more so you can view what's going on, you'll see that one of the requests here is for the page but you'll notice that there's like something attached to the URL. This is called a query string, which is kind of another discussion. But you see that I basically took the name of our input, which, or if you remember, we call it address, and it took the value of that input, which we typed in hello, and it refreshed the page and put that as a query string inside of the URL. So it's kind of strange, right? You're not really sure what you might want to use that for, but it turns out that you can use this you have the back and maybe do some filtering, refresh the page and show you some content. So for an example, let's say this was a, a filter on a product website, right? If you typed eggs and click submit, you'll notice that up here, actually, let me, um, let me give you some more context. Instead of doing address, let's change this to like filter. And I'm going to go ahead and type in eggs here and click submit. And you'll notice that up in the top, there's a query string that says filter for eggs. Okay, so if you don't know much about backend processing or how this would work, just think abstractly. We have a way to know what the user typed in 
and we can change what data is returned from the backend based on the filter that they used. But the, the use case that I kind of want to stick to is like a contact us form because I think that makes more sense conceptually for beginners. Let's go back and change this back to address. And let's add a couple of other fields like we'll do address, we'll do a phone, and I think you can say type of tell. So let me, let me take a step back. Type is another attribute you can add to inputs. And this has a couple of values that you can use. Tell, short for telephone, is one. You can use like um, number, I believe. You can use text. You could use email if you want. Like I could put one here and say input name of email and then type is equal to email. All right, so now if I refresh the page, we have three different input fields. Um, and it doesn't look that clean. It doesn't look that nice. But again, I'm just trying to show you like the mechanics of how this all works. We could add some breaks here if you wanted to like clean this up a little bit. Or if you wanted to pull in some CSS and do some styling, you could do that. But overall, we have now a contact us form. And I'm just going to add a little like header here that says contact us. H3 is just another HTML tag that you can use to basically put titles and stuff. So hopefully that's not new to you. All right. So now we have a form that has three inputs. We have an address, an email, and a phone. And it would be nice if we actually knew like what these inputs meant. So another attribute you can you can put onto input um, elements is called a placeholder. So a placeholder, you can actually put like some type of description of what the input would be. So in this case, like we could add email. And as they type in, that placeholder is going to get cleared out and just display what the user typed in. So I'm going to put placeholders in all of these. It's not the actual best user experience. You probably want to use labels. But again, we're trying to keep this a little bit simpler for beginners. So let's just go ahead and place some placeholders, email. Well, this one needs to be address, my bad. So address, email, phone. So hopefully you're sticking with me at this point. We have a form. It just has three input fields. Those input fields had different names attached to them, address, email, phone. We attach some placeholder text so it shows up on the page for users so they know like what we need to type. And then also we have a submit button. So now let's just do the same logic. Let's go ahead and clear out the network tab by pressing this, um, this clear button. Let's click submit and look at the URL here. So you see here the URL it might be really, really small to see. Actually, let's just type in some stuff. So I'll just type in like this. Email is test.example.com and this is my phone. Let's clear this out, click submit, and we get a URL here. And let's actually inspect this URL, right? So it's going to be kind of hard because there's not much, not much real estate, but I'm going to break this up into different parts. And you'll see that it took the three input fields and it kind of broke them down into a three-part query string. So one other thing I should kind of talk about when it comes to query strings is that inside of a query string, you typically have this question mark that starts the query string. And then in between, you have these little ampersands, right? So every key value pair is separated by an ampersand. You see here we have address, and that has the, the, the actual physical value that they typed in. We have email, followed by equals, and then followed by the email they typed in. And then we have phone, equals, and then the phone number they typed in. So a query string is able to combine all these key value pairs together with ampersands. And another thing I should point out that's kind of strange is that spaces are actually kind of encoded with different characters, right? So a space has a plus in a query string, and also the at symbol ha is encoded with a percent 40. So it's kind of strange to understand, um, but typically the backend is able to process that and kind of encode it and decode it as needed to kind of get that data. So just keep that in mind if you see weird things in your query string, it's just because the browser is kind of encoding it in such a way so that you can send it over to the back end and not have any issues. All right, so all that should hopefully make sense. I mean, if you don't really understand query strings, it's okay. You can kind of um, maybe watch some other videos about query strings. But the thing I kind of wanted to show you is that this form can actually do different types of actions, right? The default action is to do a get request, and it's going to do it on the same URL that the page is on, right? So in this case, we're on index.html. So it's doing a get request to the exact same page that we're on and it's attaching a bunch of query strings. But let's say on the back end you had a different route or different page that you wanted to send this data to. Let's say you wanted to send this data to like a third party service such as form submit and they have a special endpoint that you need to send this data to. So one thing that you can do is on the form itself there's another attribute called action. 
So I could do action here and you can put a URL of where you want that data to be submitted to, right? So for an example, I could do like localhost 5000 if I wanted to, and that will submit the data to localhost 5000. So let me just save that and kind of type in some default values. And if I click submit, you'll notice down here, it's actually trying to do a get request to this localhost 5000, which doesn't happen to exist, but you could change this to whatever you want. You could change this to like, I don't know, google.com and do a submit here and see what happens. Go ahead and do that. Oh, I guess I need to type in a real thing. All right, so just keep in mind, if you do a relative path, like it's thinking that google.com is an actual file on this URL. So if you wanted to do an absolute path, you'd have to do like HTTPS google.com like that. Let's go back and try to submit the form again and see what happens. So let's go ahead and click submit. And you'll notice that it actually redirected us to Google, okay? And if you look at the query string, you'll notice that it's google.com and all that data has been passed over to the Google site. So now Google can actually process our request and do something different. Like, so for an example, I think if you were to pass a query string with like question mark Q equals cats, then Google is actually gonna do a query for cats. But that's kind of out of the scope of what we're doing. But let's go back to another third party service, which I wanted to kind of talk about. So there's a formsubmit.co website. And they kind of tell you like, here is the action. Here's a URL that you need to submit that data to. And also they tell you a method, right? They tell you the method has to be post. So we haven't talked about what post is. So let's kind of go back and talk about the method because hopefully you understand what action is. Action is like the URL that you're pushing the data to. Let's change the method to post and see what happens. So let me open this up. Let's go ahead and type in some information on this field and do that request. And you'll see down here, it does request to index.html. So the same kind of behavior as it did before. But now if you look in the request itself, you'll see that there is a request method, which is set to post. Okay, this is important. If you don't know what get requests are and post requests are, it's basically just a way to describe the request that the browser is making so that the backend can do different operations on the request. So a post request is typically used for like, I'm sending you data. A get request is typically for like, I need to get data back from the backend. Um, but the, the main thing I'm trying to show you here is since it's a post request, there's typically like a body of data that's sent over. So if I scroll down to the bottom, so if I click on this payload tab, you'll notice that there's actually those three key value pairs inside our form data payload. So this is what's being sent to the backend or sent to the server. The server is gonna be able to process that payload, do something with it, and then your page is going to refresh to whatever the backend decides to return to you. That's important to understand. So if we were to go back to another third party service called form submit, You'll see here that they tell you you need to make a form that has an action that goes to their website. So we kind of already learned about what an action is. We can just say action is equal to this website. And then the method is post. So what's really happening here, if I go back to my index file, refresh the page, if I type some information in here and go ahead and click submit, this is actually doing a request to the form submit website and it's passing all that data over to them. So right, if I go back to post here, you'll see that in the URL, it's going to formsubmit.co and the payload has our information, all right? So now, if we actually look at this website that it redirected us to, formsubmit has that information, right? They can, they can process that information and do whatever they want with it. And then your page is gonna refresh to that formsubmit site. But note that we didn't actually type in a correct email address here, so their site kind of crashed. But if I were to type in like a real email, this would probably have shown something correct or like a setup page. But just note that that's how a form kind of works. The last thing I want to mention about forms is that typically when a form is submitted, your browser tries to refresh the page, okay? And if you wanted to prevent that, because sometimes you just want to send data over, but keep the user on the same page. And this is very common on single page applications. Like if you're working with React, or view, you don't want the page to just constantly refresh because then you're gonna lose all the state of the application. So what a lot of people do is inside of the, the body, 
or inside the HTML, they can put a submit method. So I can say const, or I can say function submit. And that function is going to take in an event. Okay, so that event is going to be the form submission event. And inside of this event, you can say e dot prevent default. And that's going to prevent the form from refreshing, but it's also going to prevent the data from being sent over to the back end. So keep that in mind that if you need to do some type of custom Axios request when someone submits the form or some type of custom JavaScript execution, if you do e.preventDefault, it's not actually going to hit the back end and send your data. You'd have to do that manually. But let's actually hook that up. So what I can do is on the form, there's another attribute called onSubmit. And I can just go ahead and call that submit function. Actually, so I had to refactor the name from submit to something else because I think submit is like a special word. So now I'm calling a function called run code and I'm passing the event of the submission, right? So we can use that down here. We can say e.preventDefault. And again, that'll prevent the form from actually refreshing, but it also prevents it from actually sending the request. So you actually have to do something custom here. If you want to send that data over to the back end, you would have to probably use Axios or Fetch to make a post request. So you'd have to basically get all the form data yourself, put it into an object, and send that over to the back end if you need to do some type of custom logic here. Cool, so that's about, um, I think that's about all I wanted to give you as an overview when it came to HTML forms. I hope that made sense. If, if there's anything that I left off, be sure to let me know, leave me a comment. Give me a thumbs up if this video has helped you understand more about forms or creating your own form and how data is kind of sent from your browser to the back end when you actually click on that submit button. Um, also, be sure to subscribe if you're new to this channel because I'm gonna have other content like this that should hopefully help you become a better web developer in the future. All right, have a good day and happy coding.